All right, let's get uh, started on Unit 6, this is Developmental Psychology. Some of this stuff you'll find pretty interesting. Um, developmental Psych is a field that studies how people grow and change throughout their lifespan. Now, this can be all types of different development. You have physical development, you have emotional development, you have social development. Everything you could possibly think of, how we process information, definitely changes. I've got a little girl right now, and she thinks completely different than what the adults do, and she processes information totally different than anybody else that we know. Um, they have two different types of research method. Now, you've already studied these. They've been in other um, chapters, longitudinal method, method where you follow a small group of people for a long period of time, even decades sometimes, can be very time consuming and very expensive. And the cross-sectional method where we follow, um, we just f grab kids all of a sudden at all different ages and then compare them to each other. So longitudinal much better, cross-sectional much faster. So we've already kind of covered that, so I'm just kind of kind of blaze through that. One big debate in developmental psych is determined by whether it is nature or nurture. In other words, is it your heredity that causes you to be the way that you are or is it the environment that you're brought up in? Now, this debate will go on for years and nobody will probably ever have the absolute answer to it, but most people have considered it's a little bit of both. But they use kinship studies to test what people actually inherit from their parents. Maybe twins that are separated at birth. Obviously, that's a rare occasion, but you know they can compare and contrast things like that. Um, Oprah, year, years ago, when she uh, had her show going, still, <clears throat> excuse me, she had two twins on that were separated at birth. These guys were in their 40s, but their similarities were amazing. They wore almost exactly the same clothes. They wore their hair the same way. They married wives that looked alike and had the same name. Um, it was very odd. I mean, they liked the same foods, a lot of the same things. They, their hobbies were the same, and they've never even seen each other since birth. So there's a lot of it that comes from your heredity, but a lot of it also is environment. Heredity bases itself in something called maturation. Maturation is an automatic and sequential process that results from signals. In other words, it's an automatic roadmap that you are going to follow. It doesn't make any difference what you do or how you try to change it. Your maturation is only going to happen when it happens. Um, you first have to learn to sit, then you crawl, then you stand, then you walk. No matter how much you try to teach a newborn to walk, they're not going to be able to do it. There's other things that have to happen first before they can walk. I mean, occasionally, you know, you try to do it, but, and you know they'll take one or two steps, but that's luck. They're really not walking until they've gone through all the other processes first. Uh, these things are called critical periods. It's a point in development in which a person is best suited to learn a particular skill or behavior. And the example I have here is that kids learn language easier than adults do. Right now, think about all the words you know. In order to double your vocabulary, it would take, well, you'll probably never even double it. Unless you go into some field that has its own unique vocabulary, you are pretty much maxed out as far as vocabulary goes. But think of a toddler. They learn one word. So to double their vocabulary, all they have to learn is two is one more word. Now they've got it doubled. So their, their brain is like a sponge at a certain point, and they'll point to things. They will point to, as soon as they start to learn to talk, as soon as you can possibly give them a word for everything, I mean, they just keep going and going and going and going, and you just have to keep coming up with words, and their little brain is taking it in like crazy. Now, if it's taking in two different languages, that's fine. They'll sort it all out, but they can learn language much faster than adults can. I have a friend of mine that teaches uh, uh, kindergarten. She has a lady come in twice a week and teach the kids Spanish. At the end of their kindergarten year, they're as fluent in Spanish as our Spanish two kids are. So it's pretty impressive. Uh, the main guy behind maturation was a man named Arnold Gessel. Um, the picture of Arnold right there. Uh, he, played, he said that maturation was the largest part of development. In other words, he was the nature guy, not nurture. All right. John Watson, who was a behaviorist, 
was more the other side of that. He said a little kid's brain is like a blank slate. He believed that environment would have the greatest effect on development. So these are the two opposite scientists. One says it's nature, and Watson says it's nurture. Today, most psychologists would say it's a combination of the two different schools of thought. No one is absolutely correct anymore. Another argument would be, does it occur, does your development occur in stages or does it occur continuously? Uh, the people that are all about stages felt that one learned behavior ushers in all types of new behaviors, thus pushing you to a new stage. It kind of plateaus out. Uh, I have a tendency to believe this one is a little bit more correct. Um, when you learn to speak, your whole world changes. You can ask for things and people actually respond and give you things. Um, that opens up all nine new things. When you can walk, your whole world changes. You know, it even goes back to when you can turn over. You know, if you're at the simple point where you are either on your stomach or on your back and you have to wait for somebody to turn you over, that greatly limits you. Once you can do that, bam, it ushers in all kinds of new things. The continuous people uh, believe that development takes place gradually over a long period of time. They just think that one thing doesn't mean that much, but it just means that more things are going to come along. So it's not a plateau type thing, but a long, steady, gradual climb. Now, let's talk about physical development. Despite the huge amount of growth that takes place with the newborn, most takes place before birth. You go from being something that is microscopic to about a billion times more that and coming out as a baby. You know, you're probably somewhere in between five pounds and about nine pounds. That's about the average there. But you can it is a massive amount that takes place and then once you hit that certain weight it slows down otherwise by the time you were one you'd, you'd be a giant um, so there's a little bitty guy here this is probably the smallest one that's ever actually made it it was only about 12 ounces when it was born and uh, actually made it through obviously very much premature or it could be the opposite end of that there's a big kid here usually uh, mothers that have problems with diabetes will have very, very, very large babies. And this is a very large one, 13 something pounds. Uh, that's a monster. Um, that's just a really cool picture. I like the little foot down there. D during infancy, which is until you're two, you grow a lot as well. You double your weight in about five months and you triple it in about a year. And my girl right now is exactly on that particular weight plan. Um, they grow about 10 inches in that first year too. They get a lot longer. Uh, after infancy comes childhood. It lasts until your adolescence, which is where you hit puberty. During this period, you grow about two to three inches a year. You gain about four to six pounds a year. And of course, that is totally average. Um, occasionally, you'll see on some talk show some little kid that weighs two or three pounds that it's or that's a two or three years old that weighs a hundred pounds or something because he's eating Twinkies every day since he was born. But that's something completely different. Um, babies are born with certain reflexes, involuntary reactions or responses. Uh, some st stay with the baby forever, like sneezing, yawning, blinking, and some disappear when you don't need them anymore. Um, grasping doesn't need to be taught. Um, everything that you do is in use. If you've ever played with little babies, you stick your finger in their hand and they will clamp onto it. And everybody says, oh, look at the grip on this kid. But every kid has it. It's nothing super spectacular. Uh, some of these particular reflexes are essential for survival, like breathing. If we had to teach babies to breathe, they'd never make it. So it, ha it comes right along as soon as they come out. Rooting is... Um, causes a baby to suck or swallow when their cheeks or lips are touched. You can just touch a newborn's mouth and they will spin their head towards that and start sucking on your finger. It's an automatic thing. Little puppies do it, little pigs do it, and of course humans do it. You see, touch their little cheek like that and they will spin over and start to suck on your finger. The Mara reflex is a startle reflex. It causes the baby to arch their back when they hear a sudden sound. This holds on for quite some time. Um, 
the elimination of waste is also a reflex. If you've ever been in charge of changing diapers, you know that it doesn't take much. They just keep going and going and going. You don't have to teach them that at all. As far as motor development, the development of purposeful movement is what motor development means. There are two areas. You have your gross motor development, which is your major muscle groups, rolling over, sitting up, walking, and your fine motor development, which is the smaller muscles in the hands and face, like picking things up, shaking a rattle, even speaking is fine motor development. That's why it takes so long. It's quite a difficult process to learn to speak. You have to work your mouth, your lips, your tongue, um, your lungs, everything has to work together, otherwise you don't get the right sounds. And these things vary from infant to infant and even from culture to culture. Um, you know, some of you learned to walk at about a year, some of you took a year and a half, uh, and in primitive cultures they learn to walk much faster than we do in ours. If you look at the kids we have, most of our little kids are being carried in a car seat. They're on their back almost all the time. In primitive cultures, they're in a papoose. Um, third world cultures, they have them on their back, so they're used to being upright and being off balance. And so that's how they learn to walk much faster than our kids do. Perceptual development. Uh, the per process by which babies learn to make sense of the stimuli they're exposed to. It was kind of a couple chapters ago we worked on that. Uh, babies are programmed to survey our ex uh, survey and their environment and they learn about it. The one thing they do, if you hand babies something, the first thing they do is stick it in their mouth. That's because they are used to using their mouth for just about everything they need to do. Uh, and it's the one sense that they're really good at. Uh, they put their toes in their mouth, their hands in their mouth, everything they can they put in their mouth. All babies, uh, a baby's complexity of pattern varies according to their age. A very, if you look at toys for very young kids, the first toys they have will be very primary. They will be uh, yellow, red, primary colors, very simple. They're not a lot of flashing lights. They don't need to be. Uh, they would rather have something simple than something that's got a lot of light. Now, if they get their certain age, they'll like flashing lights and bells and whistles and all that kind of stuff, but that is not something they have to have at an early age. Now, their depth perception uh, develops over time as well. You can't play catch with a one-year-old because they don't have any depth perception yet. Uh, when placed on a visual cliff, a newborn shows no fear, but by the time they're old enough um, to crawl, it will not cross the cliff. I'll show you what I mean. Look at this baby here. The pattern continues from where it's sitting to down below. It shows no fear being on that cliff. It probably has not fallen at all at this particular stage in life they can't see that there's a variance of depth there. Now as they get older, like this little toddler here, he can see that there is a drop off there. And even though mom's over there going, come on little baby, it will not cross that because it has probably fallen at this stage. Uh, it knows there's depth there and it will not even try it. Um, hearing is more developed at birth than vision. Um, Remember, you've been in the dark for nine months. You finally get out there, your vision is not that good. Uh, they'll respond to high-pitched sounds more than low-pitched sounds, although low-pitched sounds will soothe them. It doesn't make any difference what you're saying in the book. As long as you've got a nice, mellow sound to it, they will totally respond to that. They will soothe them. Uh, white noise will help put the baby to sleep. Uh, there's an app that people have on their phone. They can actually sit down next to the baby. It's just kind of a... Uh, staticky noise and babies will fall right to sleep with it. Uh, newborns can distinguish odors at birth. Uh, the same is true with also taste. Um, they know what smells good and what doesn't. They know what tastes good and what doesn't. You know, hand a little kid a lime. He will stick that lime in his mouth like he does everything else and it creates quite a reaction. Social development. Let's wait for the next um, particular lecture and we will get through that.